Okay, we welcome Mr. Prashant here. We had some discussions about just integrity and just, uh, I really loved his viewpoints about the way he sees the life. And, uh, so I asked him to join us for one of his seminars to talk about integrity and authenticity. Uh, Actually, we are going to have this lecture for as long as he wants, maybe for one hour. And after that, we will answer your questions to him. Okay? Thank you, Ali. Hey, guys. Um, so, the format of it, I want to keep it pretty loose. So, if you have any questions or anything, or you don't understand what I'm saying, just like raise your hand and we'll take it up. And I'll ask you to share as much as possible. I will share from my life about what I have experienced about in relation to integrity and authenticity and how to make life work for me. And everyone is like different, but at the end of it, we're kind of all the same in many ways. Our problems are generally the same and the way we like going through life is generally the same, unless we move away and correct whatever path we were on. When we've got problems in life, we try and try and fix them at the same level that we create our problem. And that never works. So what is really required if we want workability in our lives, anywhere where we want to succeed, uh, in any area, it is to move ourselves away from that level at which the problem exists to a different level. Once we move to a different level, we can then see everything the way it is and we can do something about it. So this is all like in abstract right now. I'll try to get as specific. And ideally what helps is as I'm talking about stuff, there's going to be some internal dialogue in your head. It happens to all of us. That's part of being human. It comes from our experiences, it comes from our teachings, popular culture, whatever we expect. We see people and we automatically think we know them. So anyone I look at generally if I'm walking outside, I've got an opinion. It already exists. There's nothing I can do not to have the opinion. But realizing that we are doing it gives us power gives us power to put it aside and then to actually experience people for who they are and who they are projecting themselves to be rather than our own opinion. That's an example of moving away from a different level. Because many times our problems are we just assume that someone is a certain way and then we act like that. That's why wars happen between cultures. That's why our whole like world is in disarray and there's no peace is because there are these stereotypes and these opinions and judgments that people create that this is good because I know it and that I already assume is bad. Um, recent example, you know, all the problems that they had in the border with like Trump and everything in the US. But anyway, so I want your participation. Integrity is about workability. Anything in your life that you want to make it work. So let's see, there are different areas in our lives, from relationships, to finances, to work, where we go to work, all of these. Um, what are some areas that you may see in your life where you want to try and apply the discussion of workability. Any hands? Anyone? Any area in your life that you feel that you might be a little bit stuck and you might not be moving? I see you nodding. Any? What's the area? What areas? Financial. <laughs> Financial. Great. Awesome. Of course. We all like have some things that you know we're looking at financially. Um, yeah, um, so lots of areas. Education, financial. Education, awesome. Uh, 
stuff. Yeah. So as we're going through this, what's going to be really helpful, if you all pick that one, at least one area, if not more, and really look at what. So, for example, for me, there's an area right now in my life where I feel like I need this stuff. It's my house in Barrie. I have a house in Barrie. And I have not sold it over the last few years. It's just been like that. It's just an area of my life that's just stuck. It's not moving. I, can't, I feel like I have no power over it. Um, and the main reason I give myself the reason, that is because I have a 150 gallon aquarium there that I don't know how to sell. So for that, the whole house has to sit still. Now, over the last few weeks, I've worked on that. I've tried to, what I would call, restore my integrity in that area. And I've moved to selling the stuff on Marketplace. And the minute I put my aquarium up for sale on Marketplace, I had 20 hits on Facebook Marketplace. I had not done this in two years because I've been thinking, oh, um, I'm going to, if I put it out, no one's going to want it. Who wants a 150 gallon aquarium? Who's got that space? And if I, if I put it up online, it's not gonna go for sale, I'll have to show it, I'll have to be busy. I'll have, I had reasons and excuses up the wazoo just to not do something. And that's very common in us. It's called being human. There are things we don't wanna do. Why? Because we have feelings, we have emotions. We have things that we want to do for all sorts of reasons and not live up to our commitments. That's cause called lacking integrity in the definition of integrity that I'm going to propose. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. There's nothing good about integrity. There's nothing bad about integrity. Integrity is not about morality. It is not about... Um, it is not about success or failure in the traditional sense. Integrity, if we look it up in the dictionary, integrity is uh, the act of being whole and complete. That is the definition of integrity. So we say something has integrity. This table has integrity because it functions like a table. It's got its legs, it's got a flat platform, it's not slanted things won't just fall off it. That's why we call it a table. It won't be called a table if it did not have integrity. It would then be a broken table. That's what it, because it doesn't function as a table. So integrity is workability in our lives. Any area, finances, education, relationships, any area in our life where things are not working, it's broken, it has no integrity. The minute we see it and we follow the steps to restore integrity, it works again. Simple as that. The table's leg gets broken, I come and replace it. I fix it enough that it can be stable. It doesn't matter what color, as long as I want it to have integrity in its function. So, um, any questions at this point? Good. Now, the thing with integrity is that we can't have that discussion on integrity or define integrity without actually talking about the foundation to integrity. And there is a foundation to integrity that comes before integrity. It's called being authentic. It's called being having authenticity. So I'm going to write that down because it, it turns out that, at least in my view, there's a formula. And it starts with authenticity. With authenticity comes... It's just what I do. Is it down there? Yeah, 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 got it. 
t-shirt. Yeah, that's perfect. No, no need to be sorry. Is this okay? Yeah. Sitting. That, without that, as I go down the steps, without this, there is no this. So it builds. And you get integrity. Once we are authentic, we can then have integrity in any area of our life. Once we have integrity, we have identity. Without integrity, we're actually not anything. If I describe the table to someone, I have given it an identity of the table to someone. I've described it to them. They've never seen the table. Come into this room. I've described the table as you can put things on it. They won't roll off. Possibly it has four legs. Possibly it's a flat surface. If I've described this and it's broken, tomorrow it has no integrity. Someone comes in, they've never seen a table before, they wouldn't be able to identify this. Because the description I gave to them, the identity I had created for the table, was it has four legs, it's stable, things don't roll off. But the person comes in, sees this, puts stuff on it, not, it rolls off because the legs are broken. This can't be a table. Without integrity, there's no identity. Even in ourselves, there's no identity. If I tell you, I'm always on time. That makes me a punctual person. What I'm describing to you is my identity. Rashawn is punctual. You may not know anything else about me. All I've said is I'm always on time. Then tomorrow we have an appointment and I don't arrive on time. There is no integrity. There's no identity. Because all you knew about Rashawn was he's on time. Now I'm not on time, so who is Rashawn? He doesn't have an identity. Same thing with honesty. Liars are liars. They have integrity. Because they identify as liars and then they lie. That's fine. Great. Now I know who they are. But if I'm saying I am, I always tell the truth, I'm an honest person, and then I lie, I suddenly lost my identity. With identity, then, only then, and this is what I've realized my problem has been for the longest time, is that I always wanted a purpose in life. What's the meaning? I'm not a very religious person, so I can't really buy into the religion uh, dictates, because that could be a purpose. There's no real answer for purpose. You can create your own purpose. But without identity, there is no purpose. When a Christian person who identifies as Christian goes and says, I am a Christian, they've got a doctrine, they've got a purpose that they can enact and live to. That's great. Or for, at least for me, I was always looking for a purpose. So with identity comes purpose. Following this, constantly brings
So um, having changed that, all my um, identity and service and everything has changed. Um, but still, people that um, knew me or people that uh, look at me from outside, they think that I'm the same loser that I was. So nothing has changed. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to change that. So I, I'm always looking for new people to show my new myself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do know what you're saying. I, I can relate to that. A few years ago, I wanted to cut out all my friends. I wanted to get rid of them because I was like, they don't get me. They're, they call themselves my friends, but they don't really get who I am. They don't get my desires, they don't get my values. I'm into motorcycle. None of my friends are into motorcycle. So one of the things that I just look at superficially is our interests are not the same. I need new friends. They're all interested a lot into IT field and startups. I'm more interested in food. There's no meeting ground. There's a whole bunch of that going on. But what happens, like you said, when I change? If I was a religious person, a non-religious person, my friends were all religious people, and now they're not, what does that mean? Does that mean I need to get new friends? Does that mean that I shouldn't change? Does that mean that, that it's all wrong? I'll get to that. I call that occurrence. So, the way we occur for people, so it's like, when I see you, there's an occurrence. You occur a certain way for me. And then I respond in response to that occurrence to you. So I behave a certain way to you. I don't behave the same way to my mom. I don't behave the same way to my nephew. I don't behave the same way to others. I am no constant thing, neither are you. No one here in this room looks exactly the same as they looked when they were in kindergarten. You change. No one's gonna look the same years from now. Right? Already got like gray hair coming in. At some point my hair is gonna go gray on my head. And then it'll be all over. We're not the same. We learn different things as well. You learn new things. You get exposed to new things. You have new experiences. I'm not the Prashant I was five minutes ago, possibly. My cells are dying. New cells are coming up. So who are you? What's your identity? Nothing. That is powerful. Not being anything. When we make ourselves something, if it doesn't come from authenticity, integrity, and identity, it, it can ruin us. When it comes from that and we create something, because here I am, I am nothing, and then I'm suddenly authentic, and, I, and I'll get into authenticity, what it really means, and I'll get into integrity, what it really means, and then beyond that, I form an identity out of it. One of the things with authenticity and integrity is understanding your values. You need to get that down. You need to know what our values are. Once you know your values, you can actually enact them. If I don't know my values, if I don't have any principles, then I'm operating out of someone else's. And that, we can never really buy into. Because they're not ours. We didn't create them. We value things more what we create, not what just society gives to us. That's why we break laws all the time. Someone says you should not jaywalk. We still jaywalk. Why? Because it's not a value to us. It's a standard that is given by society. And we always collapse values and principles with standards and ideals. And that is a big problem. That is why we don't have any identity. Because we can never be authentic when we're living up to someone else's values. You just can't be authentic. 
So let's start with authenticity. Uh, go forward quickly. So authenticity really comes down to, as I was saying about occurrence and impressions that we create in life, authenticity is really about stories. If, I, if you take away one thing from this discussion, it is that authenticity equals I love colors. Okay, authenticity. So, what is positive or right in the glass? Equals no. No stories. We're all storytellers, we're all story makers. We write amazing amounts of stories and create these things in our head as we're living. Even in communication, we're never present. Because we're not, we're not actually living in what is happening around us. We're always living in some other world. Even as you see me talk, there are thoughts firing like crazy in your heads. There are thoughts about possibly my appearance, the way I'm talking, the way I'm writing, the way things are going. What you think about authenticity is colliding with some of the things that I'm saying. What you think about integrity is colliding. All of this stuff is jumbling, is going on in our brains, and they're just firing off like crazy. And that internal process is I will term the internal dialogue. It's for everything that goes on in our heads. All this chatter, there's always this chatter going on. You can't stop it. It's like you try. You can't stop it. So what are stories? Stories are when all this chatter, and why this chatter comes in is because, because we have language. We use words to describe things to ourselves. A dog doesn't have words. It has a rudimentary form of language and communication. It growls when it's angry, it's like, you know, whatever it does. But it doesn't have the kind of constructive language that we've got. So a three-legged dog, one that's missing a leg, never gets jealous of a four-legged dog. Have you ever seen that? You ever seen a three-legged dog going in like morning and it's like, no, I'm not gonna go and eat my food because I'm that dog's gotten an extra, he should go and bring me the food. We don't see that happen in the animal world. Why? Because they don't have language. We've got language. So we can convey how miserable we are to ourselves. We can convey lies to ourselves. We can create stories. Now, it's a defense mechanism. I'm not saying that stories are bad. Stories are not good or bad. Believing in stories like it's reality is bad. Stories are okay. Stories are stories. That's part of being human. If you didn't believe the other guy in, when you were living in caves that said, oh, don't go to this kind of striped creature that I would call the tiger because it's going to eat you up. And I said, nah, that's just a story. And I walked in, I'll get eaten now. Human would not have survived if you didn't believe in stories. So stories are good and bad. They're nothing. Believing um, the ability, authenticity lies in the ability to see the story. When we can see the story, suddenly we know what to do. Because we don't just blindly believe in it. So what are these stories? Where are they coming from? These stories are coming from our past experiences. We have relationships. I had many breakups. I had a way of creating how a relationship should be. That's a story, right? Um, when we have betrayals, our friends betrayed us. Oh, like Tommy, when I was a kid, didn't share his toy with me. Now, any friend I will not trust to that extent because there was some sort of trauma that was caused and it just lingers with me. And I just keep it as a story in my head and I believe it every time and I take it to my future. So what we're really doing is taking our past, all the experiences, and we put it in our future. Our future is never empty. 
Like, we stand in the present, we look at our future, and we already know what's going to happen. Christmas dinners for a lot of people, or family gatherings. I used to go to my family gathering, I always knew how it was going to go down. Mom's going to talk about relationships with me, Dad's going to possibly bring up finances, my brother is going to talk about with Adi, my nephew, eight-year-old nephew is going to be running around spilling things and then I'll probably slip on it and fall and like hurt myself. Story, 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 story. In my head, my future, I'm already upset when I sit in my car and I start driving to my parents' house. I don't even know it. I'm not conscious of it. I'm already upset. I've already created my evening. It's done. It's a write-off. When we create it like that, there is no way it can go any other way. It just can't. You just created it. It's going to stay with you. Even if things are not going that same way, we will only see it like that. Because we're not aware that we're living in our story. The judgments that we have, the morality, our parents, we grow up as children, we are born, we don't think anything of anyone. Nothing. We don't know what's right, we don't know what's wrong, we don't know morality, good or bad, no. We are hungry, we cry. That's it. We're cold, we cry. Any displeasure, we cry. If someone tickles us, we laugh. Simple. Life is simple as an infant. And then our parents start teaching us what's right and wrong. Our society teaches us what's right and wrong. We learn about laws. We learn about religion. We learn about morality. Do unto others. All of this stuff on how to survive in that microcosm of a society. Different societies have different microcosms. That's another reason why people are just believing in the story here and believing in the story there and then fighting because their stories clash. It's all a story. They don't see it. Worlds are fighting. Uh, popular culture, movies shape the way we think, what we didn't get from our parents. Music shapes, oh yeah, I remember that moment when the song was playing. It's a great moment and like, yeah, I was like, totally in love in this moment, now that song, now suddenly I consider myself a, that I love rock music, not R&B, rock music, because I have associations with that rock music, it's a story, if I let go maybe I can actually enjoy every music, but I don't let go, it's my story, I love my stories, I want to hold on to my stories, I created them, right? Why, why get away from our stories? I mean, apart from the stuff that I'm saying. Um, getting away from our stories help us be present. Because the story isn't actually happening, ever. The past isn't happening. It's not happening right now. It never will. It's only going to happen in your head, in the story. That's all doesn't exist anymore. The future doesn't exist. It's still a story. It's a story that I call a possibility. It's a possibility right now, the future. Anything can happen. As a kid, you love living every moment. You, want to, you don't want to go to bed at night. Why? Because anything to a kid, any amazing thing can happen in the next moment. They don't know. Everything is a surprise. We, as older people, become cynical because we kind of create a negative possibility of the next moment and so we resist it so we resist our future we think of all the negative things oh, I'm gonna get old I'm gonna get sick I'm gonna die I'm gonna like do this my, my kids are not gonna love me my wife's gonna leave me just any any damn thing that we can make up in a story, we put it into our future, and then we resist it. We're humans are inherently cynical people. We're generally cynical people. But here's the thing, we don't need to be. You can put a cynical person, an optimistic person, and a pessimistic person on the same branch watching the sunset. An optimistic person will be like, oh my god, it's 
so beautiful. Oh, sunsets. A, 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 a pessimist would say, oh, no, the day's over. Crap. And a cynic would say, what does it all mean? Right? And that's, that's where we're at. We're at like, we just don't want to embrace anything. We're just like resistant. Like, yeah, I don't know. We don't take risks. We don't go do the things that are important to us. We don't go after the things that are important to us. We don't talk to the people that we want to talk to. Why? Stories. We create stories. I'm gonna go up to this person and say, hey, I'm really like, I like your coat. It's like, oh my God, he's gonna think I'm a weirdo. He's gonna think, oh my God, I've got some sort of weird fetish with coats. It's a story in my head. I haven't asked the person. I just create, and I stop myself at that moment and I walk away, right? Why? Because I created a story. I don't know how things are gonna go. So I talked about internal dialogue. That's the chatter that goes on in my head. That prevents us from being present right now. It tells you what is and what is not possible for you. It tells you that. It's telling you all the time. It doesn't empower you. It robs you of it. It makes us weak, that internal dialogue. Always makes us weak. And it distracts us from our experience because in that feeling of being weak, we're distracted. We're not present. We're somewhere else. And then it connects whatever you're listening into what you already know. You never really experience that as new. What you do is like, oh, is, you're always checking. This person is saying this. Is this true from what I've read? Is this true from what this person said? Is this? So we're always doing that counterbalance. And so what that does is it doesn't help us actually listen to what the other person is saying. You know, in today's day and age, communication is like two television sets pointed towards each other. Loudest volume. No one's listening. They're both talking. Most of the times, I started catching myself in communication. I'm listening to someone, and if I'm not present, before that person has finished their sentence, I'm already thinking of the, what I'm going to say. I haven't actually heard the end of their sentence. I think I know. I feel from the very first words, I already know. And I'm already ready. My internal dialogue is going on, it's churning away, making sure that I attack that point with my point, instead of listening. Listening is letting the other person stop, think for a few seconds, and then speak. If we get into the practice of doing that, it just automatically stills that internal dialogue. It doesn't interfere with us being present. I talked about occurrence, as you were saying, about um, how people think you haven't changed when you feel you've undergone change. It is because you haven't changed with them they still think you're the same person. Change is seen. Change appears like this. And people will change their minds about people. We do all the time. It's like We say this all the time. Like, oh yeah, Tony, I know Tony. Tony used to be like this, is like this now. We do give people change. We meet someone after a long time and they go, oh my God, you've changed. <laughs> we do. We don't think people have changed when they haven't changed for us. The key is to start realizing how you, we are occurring for others. And it's a dance because at the root cause of everything, of all our interaction, are, the root cause of this change thing is our actions and interactions and what we say to each other. And those are the key things. Otherwise, there's nothing. You only know of me from what you see and what you hear. You don't know how I am with my dog, your Yorkshire Terrier, Ollie, or my nephew, or my mom. You can't, because this is the occurrence, and this is the way I present. So the way you present to me 
is how I know you. The words that you use, the actions that correlate or not correlate with those words, then I create that for you. So we talked about the internal dialogue, and we talked about how it actually results in a loss of power. And all of this is coming from authenticity. Uh, sorry, from uh, stories that we are creating that prevent us from being authentic. What, what authenticity is, so all of that is not authenticity. Stories are not authentic. What authenticity is, is it's simple. Do the things you want to do. Don't do them because someone else wants you to do them. Do them because you want to do them. That's the key. Uh, I think uh, the audience here hasn't had a good distinction between stories and what is not a story. Could you make some examples or just uh, some of our participants in order to extract from us a story? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, let me give you an example of how I got a new mom. So, for the longest time, <clears throat> I had this thing about my mom that she's not happy with me. That's what that was my story, and I'll tell you how I got to understanding why that's a story. Every time she would call me. I used to look at the phone and I saw no caller ID because her call phone does not have a caller ID and everyone else has caller ID. So I knew my mom is calling me. So I used to look at it and every time the no caller ID used to show up, I used to like have this stress reaction inside. I was like, damn, it's my mom again. Like, and I know what's gonna happen. She's gonna talk to me about two things. She's gonna talk to me about getting married. She's going to talk to me about having kids by getting married. And she's going to talk to me about my work. So my mom is a professional and she's considered a very successful professional. And she comes from this cultural background in India where Indians prize something that is a stable job and a permanent job. So really, the options for any middle class or upper middle class family as they're going through uh, the education system is like, and I was told by my parents, you're becoming a doctor or you're becoming an engineer. And as kids, you don't know. You just grow up and you go through it. You take sciences in grade 10. Grade 10, what do I know about like life? Nothing. My notions are like completely off the charts. So my mom's context is that. She comes from this background where she considers herself successful because she followed the path. That's what parents ask her to do. Now, there are many other reasons why I think that she is successful. Won't get into that. I'm talking more about my relationship with her. So my mom, I felt, even though I became a professional, I graduated computer engineering from the University of Toronto, and I consider myself a success, like in the traditional sense. But I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy because I just didn't feel that I had a purpose. I used to design electrical grids for Hydro One. And I was like, it's not something that I'm interested in. I don't like doing this. I was a consultant, I was making good money. Like nothing else was lacking. The people around me were good, the work people. People are people. So my relationships with them were, was good. But I had a big problem here. I wasn't happy because I didn't have my purpose. I realized now is I didn't have identity, didn't have integrity, and I definitely wasn't authentic. So my mom, whenever she called me and she talked about work, to me it was like she thinks I'm a failure. And 
and I'm actually happy with this direction of not doing engineering consulting and going and doing something else. I'm actually happy with it. She is not happy with it. So what's going to happen is at the end of her life, she's going to die thinking I'm not happy and I'm not a success when I would have been a success. So my reason and my story for getting upset at her was simple. It was, I want her to see me as a success that I see myself. And she doesn't, because she constantly keeps telling me. I mean, maybe marriage will happen, maybe kids will happen, maybe not. Why can't she just be happy with me? Why does she need me to bring in someone else into the family for her to feel like I'm a success? So I was resentful. I was withholding. That relationship for me was not moving anywhere. But I was happy with it. I was like, but that's how moms are. That's what I see in the TV. Everyone is upset with their mom, so it must be the right way to be. It's just human. There's nothing that can be done about this. It's all good. Until I attacked it from a perspective of integrity. I will get to integrity, but a key thing about integrity is about, as I mentioned, values and principles. So combine that with stories. All the story of my mom, what it was doing to me, was it was preventing me from actually seeing who my true mom is. Until I decided, I'm not gonna create this story. I want her to tell me whether I am successful or not. I want her to use her words and tell me, because I am done assuming this. I'm done thinking she thinks I'm a failure I want to hear it. So I sat down one day, we're having tea after a meal, as we usually do, and I asked her, Mom, do you not think I'm successful? And she was like, no, you're very capable, you're very, like, you've got a lot of potential, yeah, I definitely think that you're successful, you're like, and then I was like, why do you tell me I should have kids? I had never asked her that question. Right? Because it was assumed, like, I had a story. She's obviously asking me to criticize me. Why else she would? She wants me to be complete. I'm not complete according to her. I need to have kids. Because I was also adding the Indian context to it. So then she said to me, she was like, well, you know, Prashant, when I got pregnant with you, it was my first child. And your dad and I were not prepared for it. We didn't want to have it. But, and at this point in the kind of communication, I haven't let her finish. And my mind, my internal dialogue is just going, yeah, I knew it. I knew it. She just <laughs> doesn't even want me. I'll always be a failure, right? And I was thinking of things to say in return because I didn't let her complete her sentence. But I fortunately shut up. And she went on. She said, we decided at some point we need to start a family, so we might as well start now. So we had you. And watching you grow up has been the most amazing joy of my life. I love you, and I love the person you've become. All I want is for you to experience the same thing. That's why you tell me to have kids? Not because I'm incomplete? She's like, no. You seem unhappy. Because I was. Because I didn't have a freaking purpose and I didn't have an identity. I was unhappy. She saw it. She's my mom. She can see it even without seeing me. And she, all she wanted to do was bring some happiness into my life by suggesting the only thing she knows. Have kids. That's her way of looking at it. There's nothing wrong about it. There's nothing right about it. It doesn't mean anything. All it really means, I can make it mean what I want it to mean, which is, she loves me. Now I can make it mean that. Before, the same thing. I made it mean, she's not unhappy with me. I was unwanted, all of that. I 
time made it mean that. Now, at that level, I could have done nothing. When I switch to a different level of actually listening to her and understanding her perspective, I could take that story, do away with it, create another story out of facts, out of what she said, which is she thinks I'm a great person. That is the power of removing the story from the context. Suddenly now, I look forward to conversations with my mom. Uh, what was the story you had about your mom before today? That she thinks I'm a failure. Uh, that was a story. That was the crux of it, right? And then there were a lot of my own inauthenticities and insecurities that came into play. Like I thought that she didn't think I was successful. I was. I. I should continue doing engineering consulting because I wouldn't be good at anything else. That was another story that I had created. That was because of my own insecurity. I felt. I actually felt that this is the only thing I can do because I haven't got an education here. Everything else, I might have to go back to school because I was stuck in that way of thinking. That was my story too. It's all stories, guys. It's all stories. There's no facts here, right? These are all stories. There's no facts. How do you know you can't do something? That is what comes into authenticity. It's actually the next thing I want to talk about which is the fallacy, the fallacy of can't. Henry Ford once said, <clears throat> whether you think you can, or that you can't, you are usually right. If you think you can't do it, you can't do it. If you think you can, you can. It's as simple as that. Because of the freaking story. We can create an empowering story and live in it. We can rob ourselves of power and create a weak story and then live in it and rob ourselves of authenticity, integrity, <coughs> identity, and purpose. You should know that you can't... So, you can't know that you can't do something. Right? You just can't know that. You can say it. But you can't know it, because to know it, you should try to do it. Then you can be like, I can't do it. But there's a massive rock here, right? Like maybe this table, right? Um, and say it's heavier than I can lift. And I can't, I can't just say I can't. If I try to lift it and I can't, now I know I can't. But just standing there, it could have been made with like foam. I don't know that. This is just a story, just look at the table. It's not, you may think that you can, but how would you prove it? If you think about it, if you do accomplish something, then you've proven that you can do it. But if you don't accomplish something because you haven't even tried it, then you don't know that you can't do it. You have to really try it and prove it. Can't, when you use the word can't, it's at best an assumption. And an assumption is a story. That's all it is. And it's a dangerous one. It keeps us from taking risk in life. It keeps us from actually going after what you want, what you truly want in life. It stops me from talking to someone at a bar and complimenting their code. It stops me from going after that one job position that I might want because I think I'm not qualified and I can't do it, so I don't apply. It stops me from doing the things, going to possibly even going to the gym, possibly keeping sticking to my diet. Anything stops us from that because we think we can't. And it's an assumption. Double your finances, your business, your success. Everything is limited when we think that we can't do it. Now, just because you can do it, I know I can lift that table. Just because you can do it, it doesn't mean that you will do it. All that means is that you certainly won't do 
do it if you think you can't do it. I can do it. I might not want to do it. That's different. I can't do it and then preventing myself from doing it even if that's what I want to do. That is a problem. So authenticity is really about going after what you want. Also means is that it is going after that your actions and your behavior, your actions and your behavior match what you want. So you act in that way, that's authenticity. You behave in that way, that's authenticity. Foundation for everything, to be honest, in my in my humble opinion, is a foundation. Comes with that integrity becomes easy. Integrity is not easy because human beings are not wired for integrity. We are not born with integrity. Integrity is a made up concept. Integrity is made up by human beings in language, in words. A dog has no integrity and at the same time, it has integrity because there's like there's no definition for a dog for integrity. And a dog that is authentic, a dog will go after food when it wants food. A dog will wag his tail when it wants to wag his tail. It's actually massively authentic. But for integrity, you need a man-made structure. We need tools. We need to create it. Integrity is very artificial. It is the state of being whole and complete, like the table. And because it's whole and complete, it works like the table. We as human beings, when we are whole and complete, we work in every area, we will get what we want. But when we're incomplete, then that area is stopped. It's not accessible. We won't go in that direction. We will not get our finances resolved if we don't have integrity. We will not have good relationships. My mom, and my relationship with my mom will keep deteriorating. I would have lost all my friends by now if I hadn't understood integrity. It's not about morality. It's not about right. It's not about wrong. It's not about good. Not about bad. It's not about being a good person. That is not integrity. Integrity is simply about workability, whether something works or not. <clears throat> it's about making one workable and not broken. Whenever we feel we're struggling in some area, what's really happening is we're getting out of integrity. We're broken. Well, thank you. Cheers. Whenever you feel that there's some area in your life that is just not going the way you want it to go, I consider you to ask one question to yourself in that moment. And the question would really be, where in this area have I not kept my word? That's the key way to look at integrity, as keeping your word. Or the one thing that you want to take away is no stories. But if there's a second thing you want to take away, that would be three flavors. This is broken down into three different paths. First path, and I call this the levels of integrity, is keeping your agreements and promises. You promise something to someone, you agree on something to someone, keep it. Never be I promised to Ali, I will be here at 3 p.m. And I 
I used to be a guy. Notice I used to be a guy because there was a different version of Prashant a few years ago who actually used to say that I'm not punctual. My friends knew they are planning a party. Surprisingly, I still have friends. But they are planning a party that would invite me one hour before the party starts because they knew I'm going to be at least one hour late. And even then, I had figured it out and I was even later. And that's just, that's it. There's nothing wrong with it. There's actually nothing wrong with it. What is the problem there? Although there are no problems, and I don't want to use that word. Uh, but what is happening there is there's a lack of workability in my relationship with my friends. They see me as a not punctual person. Now, because of their good grace, because they like certain things about me, they want to keep me around, maybe, and they want to expose themselves to me, they would still invite me to the parties. But there was no workability in terms of reliability. My friends couldn't rely on me because I was not punctual. I was not keeping my word. Ever. I wasn't even aware that that's something that I needed. I didn't even have a definition for integrity. To me, it was just like, I'm just living through life. That's just how it is. I had traffic happen, whatever. And then here's the beauty of it. Go in there. We all do it. I probably did the most of it. <clears throat> Go in there and uh, my friend says like, why are you late? I don't tell them that I left the house like half an hour late during rush hour. I didn't think that it was rush hour. It's 5 o'clock, 4.30. Yeah, no. And I would blame it on the traffic. I would be like, yeah, the traffic, or the weather. Oh, I'm Ollie, my dog. Like, he's just like, he had to be taken out for a walk. What is all that? All that is excuses. Excuses for me not keeping my word. Do excuses matter? No. Because what happened? Excuses are stories. What really happened? What really happened, I didn't arrive on time. That is what actually happened. That is a fact. Look at your watch, and when Prashant entered the door, he entered one hour late. That is a fact. Everything else is a story. So I'm lacking integrity because I promised, I agreed to a party that started at 5 p.m., but I showed up at 6 p.m. That's lacking integrity. Now you might think right now, right, that this is a small area. It's, oh, it's, And sure, there are many areas of our lives that we just don't want to focus on the integrity aspect. It just happens. What I'm really talking about when it comes to integrity is any area in your life that you want to make work. I wanted good friends. I want my friends to rely on me. I want my friends to call me and say, hey, can you help me? That shows connection. Because I want to be able to call them and say, can you help me? Because we can't go through life by ourselves, not with the structures that we've created. Maybe at some point, when our caveman life, you could have found the cave and like, when you had all the skills. Not now. Now we need the garbage man. We need the TTC driver. We need the cops. We need people around us. We need people to talk to. We need people to love to show love back. We need to have emotional exchanges. We are connected all the time. We don't see it. We don't see it and we don't bring workability. We don't bring integrity so it doesn't work. Once we bring in that integrity, it works. And it's fulfilling as crazy especially when you're not listening to your stories, then that suddenly it opens up new things and new possibilities. Oh, so you know, Brian, yeah. Uh, can you define integrity in some words? Because we don't have any, as I know, any version of words to put it down to integrity. How do you define integrity? Right, so the overarching meaning is being whole and complete, which I went over already. Anything being whole and complete, or a relationship being whole and complete. How that manifests is at three different levels. 
So the levels are, and the first one I was talking about, is promises and agreements. Keeping your promises and agreements. The second level is to look at life, and I touched on this briefly before, to look at life from values and principles, not standards and ideals. So what is a standard? Anyone want to take a guess what a standard is? Like tradition? Sure, absolutely. That can be a standard. What's a value? Could be right, could be wrong. Interesting. Yeah. Values could be morality. Interesting. Yeah. What in morality? Because morality is a big umbrella. Um, Something which, which, which feels right for you. It's for you. Interesting. Yeah. It's bang on, actually. Bang on. How is that different from uh, standard? Standard is sure. It means you. So the norms. Society yeah. says you should do that, you shouldn't do that. But uh, actually, the one that you said, uh, values, would be something that you feel it is right for you. So. Yeah. Brilliant. It's right on. That's exactly where I'm headed. So standards and ideals are something that someone else gives us. Right? It comes from outside us. Hmm. It does not exist inside us. It is important for comparison. A standard is a metric of comparison. So I say, that person has got a million dollars, and that person has got $40,000. In some world, $40,000 are very rich, right? Some world, some time, some era, $40,000. But now, let's look at the context. I just use a standard to compare their richness. That's a standard I've just used because it's using to compare. So what to me is rich, is say a million dollars is rich. That is a standard because society says it's rich. You know, you get the Forbes top billionaire like list or whatever and they classify it as above this, these are rich people. Below this, they're medium. There's no actual distinction. We created it, right? Society created it, not us independently. We didn't create it. That's the problem. Value, on the other hand, and I'm, I'm going to go back and like read this since I wrote it down. Um, so, a standard, something established as a rule or a basis of comparison, that's a standard. What is an ideal? An ideal is thought to be as perfect, right? like an ideal body. An ideal body looks like this. An ideal face looks like this. Um, ideal life. Ideal family. Ideal kids. Ideal mom. I had an ideal mom in my mind. She should just be really happy with my life choices. It's thought to. It's thought of as perfect. The perfect model, exactly as someone would wish. And we generally walk through life, looking at everything through ideals. That person shouldn't be doing this. That person should not be littering on the street. I pay my taxes here. That person should not be littering. The bus driver should stop slower. Should. We use that word. Whenever we use the word should, it means we are resisting what life is and trying to live it by an ideal of what we think it should be. That's an ideal someone else gave to us. And that's how we're living life. And actually, if something like that doesn't happen, that person litters over there on the other side of the street, I get offended. I am offended because that person, do you think that person did it to offend me? Probably not. Probably didn't even know I exist. Yet, I'm standing on this side of the street, watching him litter and getting really offended, ruining my all because I'm living in this idea of what he should be doing and should not be doing. Also why we have wars, again. What should the other country be doing? What should they not be doing? We don't look at it as values and principles. We look at more as ideals and standards. That's when the problem happens. And 
that is the logic of should, right? So when we say that, it is we actually talk about an ideal. Whenever we say should, we generally are referring to an ideal that is playing in. So the, one of the key things is whenever I am talking and I suddenly say should, I become more like, did I just say should because there's an ideal? And invariably, I find I'm living in the ideal. Like I just said, oh yeah, you, sh you should have invested before means that there's a certain way that that person should have been doing it because I think it should have been done that way and it's personally to me. And then suddenly I have to remove myself from that and I go, no, there is no should. The person did what they did. There's no answer to life. So why should someone be doing anything? Now we come to, so those are your standards and ideals and they're given by society or something external to us. What we then, I'm proposing, is we follow principles and values. And the principle is the beginning or origin or cause of something. So it's a principle. I have a principle. If I have a principle that I want to be um, always be honest. A principle is more about ourselves. So we say, I always want to be honest. Living life like that and seeing a situation through, have I lived according to my principles here or not? That is actually authenticity and can lead into integrity. Because it's your principles. And you're more likely to follow your principles. It is more satisfying, it is more fulfilling to follow your principles rather than believe someone else's standard or ideal of society. saying that, uh, let me rephrase that and then you can correct me, you're saying that you're happy and content, but you have no street cred, which is like a piece of paper that says this degree, that degree, and you want to talk about happiness. Well, if you're happy, I want to hear about why, what makes you so happy. How do you keep being happy? You don't need a doctorate in happiness to be happy or to talk about happiness. That's a story. Right? Have you... So what I would say to that, first of all, that's an abstract, I understand that, but ideally this works way better if you actually apply it to something in your life, something real that you feel in your life. Well, uh, from this is how I know my um, culture. It, um, Alan Beer was a uh, graduate of uh, the best university in Iran, probably the one that's sitting here. I, I'm not saying that, I'm not offending anyone here, please don't take it wrong. But um, a lot of audience um, go, want, tend to hear things from someone that has achieved um, valuable things in their the standards are important to, in happiness because it makes us uh, acceptable for others and that's a term for happiness. Do you accept that? This is the question. If I don't have a good um, degree, nobody would hire me. Your assumption is not... That is, right, as you said it. It's an assumption, it's a story. Did someone say that? Right? So then I would have to go, and this is why I say it helps to be concrete in terms of If you told me, I went here and that I did not get the job <clears throat> because I did not have the degree, then I would ask, okay, when you applied for the job, did we look at the qualifications required? Did it say that you needed a degree? 
did you still go ahead and apply because it was important to you? Okay? Perfectly fine at this point. But here's the thing. There is a first level of integrity that deals with keeping your promises and agreements. When that you see that job description, that is sort of an agreement. When we read it and we go, okay, people who should apply have a degree, right? And I don't apply, and I still apply. I'm not living by that agreement because I don't have a degree. I'm still applying. Now, nothing wrong or right about it. There's no right way to do it. I say go for it. You want like you want to have power. You want to go after what you want. You want to be authentic. You really want the job. Go for it. Knock on the door. Just stand in front of the person for the longest time. Say, I'm eager. I really want to be here. I will learn everything that you have to show me. Sincerity and authenticity shows through. It doesn't get hidden. When you're authentic, when you really want something, you do it. Everything else is a story. Now, if you don't get it, the job, no matter how authentic you've been, then the way to look at it is not create a story, ask them why. And when they say that because you don't have a degree, that's okay. Because they already said that in the job description. That is the agreement. You were the one violating the agreement by applying for it. So you, you need to also have that kind of, that integrity to feel that if things don't go my way, that's okay too. Not everything has to go my way. But that doesn't mean that that should stop you from pure action. The only, what that does, what that way of doing business or living your life does, is it prevents you from having regrets. Because regrets are essentially our authentic desires that we don't act on. I only have a regret with my, in my relationship with my ex because there's some things that I feel I could have done better. I never have a regret about what she did. I have a regret about what I did. Regret only comes from when you're not acting authentically and then you keep moving on without completing it. So that's what I would say to that whole thing is you can go in if you own it, that I can talk about happiness, well then it will like seep from your pores everywhere. Everyone will see it. When you go and ask for that job, they'll be like, damn, she's one happy person. That's it. You would have created your identity. There's no way you're not going to get a job if you're actually truly authentically happy and you're just really going for it. So that's why I say pick the area in your life that you really want, and then try and apply these. And then you call me and tell me I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get the result that I, that I wanted. Because I'm promising everyone in this room. There are many ways of going about life. There are many paths. What I'm suggesting is, this path is a formula to getting what you it because simple you start out with what you want you back it up with integrity the three levels you do not break your promises and agreements in that area you go look at everything through values and principles don't believe in standards and ideals and the third and the key thing is to treat yourself as your word. It may seem the same thing as keeping your word. It's not the same thing as keeping your word. Treating myself as my word is if I tell my friend Ali that I'm pumped that I will be there, then I have no other option but to be there at that time. That's it. The end of it. That is the hardest level of integrity, to be yourself <coughs> your word. So when I say something to someone, it's not just about keeping that promise and agreement with someone. It's about keeping that promise and agreement with yourself. That 
is the hardest thing to do. How many of us have started, like, I don't know, workout regimes that we haven't kept? Anyone? Right. How many of you start, like, diets that we haven't, like, maintained? And why? Because we don't, we don't give ourselves, we don't treat our word to ourselves with integrity. We can think many things, think many things, but when we give our word, that's a different level. Thinking we can't stop happening. We will think the way we will think. Word is in our power, is in our control. We can think it. I was not given the option not to be born in India, not to be born to my parents. I was not given the option of the color of hair that I want. I can probably go change it. Now, like cut it, we can do certain things with it. But I wasn't really given the option of being who I am, really. I wasn't. My teachers, my experiences, like all of that stuff, it formed me as a person that I became. But there is something that you do control, and that can create your identity. And I can identify myself as Indian. Well, actually, I was Indian when I was born. <laughs> now I don't even have an Indian passport. I've got a Canadian passport. What is that? My nationality has changed. My hair color is changing. Everything is changing about me all the time. Everything is changing about you all the time. So why do we stick to identifying or limiting ourselves as certain people? Because we can really be anything we want to be. The only limitation that comes in the way is the word can't, which I talked about, where we say we can't. Because we form an identity, we put the can't there, and then there are certain things that we just can't do. And we can only do some other things. And that creates our identity. So when we look at values and principles and look at life through that, it opens that up for us. Because without that, we don't really know who we are. When we start defining our values and principles, we start forming an identity. I'm a punctual person now. I show up every time. I show up on time. On time or before time. Never late. Not even by a minute. It's conscious. I went through almost my entire life being late. I was late to my own birth. I was a delayed kid. And now, I'm always on time. I'm no longer the identity of before where I was always never punctual. Now I'm always punctual. And that's just it. Like allow my friends to see me. I didn't have to tell them. I just showed up. And you know, here's what happened. When I first showed up to a party, and they were like right on time. They were like, ooh, Sean. <laughs> Literally. And then like people were coming in and they were like, guys, are we late? Because they saw me there. <laughs> they, they lost their identity because of my new identity. You see what I'm saying? Because their world was shaken. They're like, push on, oh, we're never late. Never on time. What happened? And I'm like, did you sleep here? Because how else did you make it on time? But now I have a new identity, guys. So when we live through values and principles, why that is so good is because we then experience each other as whole and complete. No one is broken. Everyone is whole and complete. Ali there, if you look at him, he is the perfect Ali He's his own perfect alley. There's no other alley like him. He's perfect. In his own way, he is perfect. So is everyone here. You're your perfect selves. Who else are you gonna compare yourself to? There's no one. It's just you. And for yourself, it definitely is just you. You might even be dreaming me up right now. 
you exist because you feel you exist. Like Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. I am. I don't know about the existence of anyone. I might just be dreaming this whole thing up. The only thing I can know is that because there's a dreamer, if there's a dream, there's a dreamer. That's all we can know. So you know you exist. I can't know you exist, actually. That's, that's the truth of reality. Which then breaks down what is reality. Everything is. There's no reality. There's no truth. There's no absolute truth in life. We can create it. One way of creating it. Um, so, and unlike standards and ideals, they're used, standards and ideals are used for comparison. So when we compare, we end up going with, we can always find something missing in one thing or the other. And that is the danger of standards and ideals. And people are the way we, they are. People are just people. They are just themselves. You are just yourself. The way, and we never actually discover anything new about anyone because we have this preconceived notion and a story and we're looking at them through standards and ideals and we're not actually listening to them. All of these things cause us to not experience people new. How could I, at like the age of 38, have seen a brand new mom sitting right across from me at the table? I got a new mom that day. I could not believe what she was saying. And she was still sticking to her guns that you should get married and have kids. But it just in that moment, that switch just switched for me and I went, she's saying this because she thinks I'm an awesome person. That's it. She wasn't saying it because she thought I was incomplete. She was saying it because she wants to repeat it. I was flabbergasted. I hugged her and kissed her. Like it was just a new thing for me. I was just like, I just couldn't even believe it. <clears throat> so we defined integrity. That's what integrity means to me. We if integrity is whole and complete, there are many ways that we can lack it, that we can be without integrity. You, we can never, ever be completely in integrity all the time. It's impossible. The reason is possible. If I tell Ali I'm going to be here at a certain time, and suddenly there's a crash on the DVP, and I'm stuck in between those things, there are certain circumstances that I just can't control. I get a flat, I get something, and I'm not able to make it on time. Now, at that moment, I'm half an hour late, I'm no longer a punctual person. That is a fact. You cannot take that away from the fact. Now, come in the reasons and excuses. Closely following the fact, because we all need to have stories. So I'm going to then say that, oh yeah, Ali, I wasn't on time. That is a fact where I'm lacking integrity. So whenever we're dealing with other things other than ourselves, we can never completely be sure of ever having integrity. We will be out of integrity. There are circumstances and things like flights get canceled, road construction happens, things you haven't even thought of can happen, and you can be out of integrity. So it's always going out. The one thing that we don't realize many times is because when I say this to Ali, I'm like, hey Ali, I came in and I'm like 30 minutes late. I'm still not in integrity because I haven't done anything to restore it. With integrity, the way it works is you go out of integrity. Go out. something happens. So when we're lacking integrity, we're broken at that moment. The table's missing a leg. So if the table's missing a leg and it's just lying there and I can't use it as a table, 
it's no longer has integrity, what do I do next? Can it ever have integrity? Fix it. You can fix it. You can bring in another leg, fix it. Call it restoring integrity. So you go out of integrity, then you restore. And suddenly you're back into integrity. <clears throat> How does this restoring integrity work? Restoring integrity works when you can understand what happened as a result of lacking integrity. See, if I create a mess somewhere, then I need to clean it up. I created the mess, I need to clean it up. That is restoring integrity. But until we understand what mess was created, we can't clean it up. Well, that's what happens when we come and give excuses and reasons. We're not cleaning it up. We're just not even bothered to understand what happened. We just plow right ahead. And then what happens is it remains incomplete in our minds. And when it remains incomplete, it stays in our back, and we put it into our future, and we repeat it again and again and again, like a cycle. We keep doing the same things and we keep expecting a different consequence. I think Einstein called that the definition of stupid. If I come in late, and I'm 30 minutes late, now I've lost integrity with Ali. <clears throat> now I've got to ask him, Ali, Steps to restoring integrity. I don't need apologies and I don't need excuses. That takes you away from restoring integrity. You can tell them what happened. I can tell them, hey, listen, I'm late. I had, I got through construction. This, this, this happened, man. This was like really bad. I had to change my tire and all this stuff. But it doesn't matter. Till now, it's all blah, 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 because here's what's going on. I'm talking about me and what I went through. But the promise I made was to him. I'm not asking him what he went through. I'm just justifying my stand. That's what I'm doing. It's not restoring integrity. That's leaving it incomplete. So here's what I do then. Step one to restore integrity. Acknowledge. No excuses, no reasons. Acknowledge. Ali, I was late by 30 minutes coming to your event that I promised I would be at. Full stop. That's acknowledge. Now I'm done, step one. Two more to go. <clears throat> step two is about understanding the other, the impact that you created, the mess that you created. So step two would be me actually asking Ali, what happened when I wasn't here for 30 minutes? What did you have to do? What didn't get done? How can I make it up? How can I make it up follows the asking of impact and listening to it. Not already thinking about it. When I ask Ali, Ali, I was like 30 minutes late. What happened? Maybe there's a gazillion things that happened. I don't even know because I wasn't here. So I need to understand that. <clears throat> when I understand that, then I can either suggest a solution that seems common to me to suggest, or I can ask him how he wants me to make it up. That is having integrity. And that is cleaning up my mess. Not what I think is right. Because what I think is right is just me coming and giving him an excuse and then walking away. I'm justified. That's not integrity. Integrity is making sure that he, because see what's happened at that time. I didn't come in on time. I don't have an identity anymore. Because he knows me as punctual. I don't have an identity anymore. So now what I'm really trying to do is restore that identity. 
I'm trying to get back to being a punctual person. With whom? With Ali. Because I've done this to Ali. I haven't done this to someone else. Because if I did it to someone else, I would be doing it with them. I need him to tell me what the impact was. I need him to see that I have integrity that I want to make up for it. And then I want to actually clean up that mess in whichever way he wanted me to do. Oh, can you stay half an hour later to help me finish this thing? And if I'm not going to be lacking integrity half an hour later with someone else, then I would stay and help him out. If not, then I would suggest, I would be like, Ali, I can't, I've given my word to this other person and I, I, I need this time to go there. Can I do it Sunday? Can I do it another time? Is there any other way I can make up for it? No, it has to be done like right, right then. Okay, let me call the other person. I'm not out of integrity yet. If I call someone and I tell them I might not be able to keep a promise, help me work this out, I still have integrity. I haven't broken anything yet because it hasn't happened yet. When it doesn't happen, you're still complete. If it happens, how you clean it up and not cause other things to happen, goes <laughs> back to being complete. So the steps. Destroy integrity. I'm out of integrity. I acknowledge. I'm out of integrity. I ask for the impact. What happened? How can I make up for it? And then I try and make up for it. And we we'll make up for it. How do we make up for it? We make up for it by giving another promise and keeping that promise by declaring a promise. Words are very important. Words help us communicate. Words have a lot of power. Everything in life is created in language. And I mean literally everything. This table? I wouldn't know what this is if I didn't have the word table for it. In fact, if someone who had first created the first table ever had not actually used words to convey to someone how to build a table, what a table does, what to call it, it would not exist. The first person that created the wheel, so I rolling, told someone about it, they talked about it, they came up with uses for the wheel, they started applying it in different places. Everything are relationships. Everything exists in language. So the most powerful thing we've got is words. That gives power. Words can take away power. Words can give power. Life happens in language, nothing else. We think it's actions. You know, a lot of people say actions speak louder than words. No, they don't. Words start everything. If you have integrity, you have authenticity, then suddenly words become power. If I give my word to Ali that I'm going to be there and he knows it and he sees me do this every single time, that means I have integrity, I have an identity, my word means a lot to him after that. <coughs> so, I'm going to actually open up the thing for questions because what I do want to talk about after integrity, the two things are identity and purpose. And I've already like said a lot about identity as we've been going about. Um, the simple thing to remember about identity, um, which I've kind of like already talked about, is that you can create, the, the way I look at it is, there are two ways, and I've defined them like this, that there is a way to be, have an identity that is ordinary. So I won't be able to write it that thing. But just understand, there's an ordinary and an extraordinary way to be in life. That's it. There is an ordinary way to be in life, which we're born, we do things, we believe in our stories, we go on living. There's nothing wrong with that. 
There is nothing good or bad with that. It's not about morality. It's we live our lives. And it's like and a lot of people like think that they're fulfilled. Great, all the power to them. Then there's an extraordinary way to live. And the extraordinary way to live is to live outside of yourself. By keeping yourself as close to your word as possible, just by being your word. That's the way to then you start realizing what is important to you. Because when you start suddenly keeping your word, you start realizing that you are giving your word out too much. You suddenly start realizing that. I used to say to my friends, like I was like in a conversation at a bar and everything, oh yeah, it's a Super Bowl weekend coming up. Yeah, great. All right, cool. Yeah, set up a party. I'll be there. And then he sets up a party and I go, no, 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 I got something else that day. Like something simple like that, right? And this can be applied to as big as you want, right? I mean, how do we get married? Someone says that and says, I declare you man and wife. Words. Suddenly from that point, you're man and wife. Words. Simple. Baptizing. Even Christians, like, you know, you give, you give someone a name. Just by that name, they become an identity. So, when we talk about identity, we're really saying, who do you want to be? We keep going through life saying, like, oh, I'm finding myself. There's nothing to find. You're right here. What are you, what are you finding? <clears throat> There's nothing to find. It's not outside. It's right here. You all have all the answers you will ever need for your life. The reason you may have an issue seeing it is because of the stories. When we become authentic and we truly just keep following step by step where we want to go, what we want to do, we suddenly also become have integrity. Because if I really want to do this, someone comes at me from something like a standard, oh, you shouldn't be doing this because like here's a standard, do this man. No, it's my value and principle. I'm here to do this. And you keep doing it, you have integrity, you start keeping your word and you start identifying yourself as your word, then suddenly what we all realize, and everyone will realize the same thing, I feel, I'm saying this with a lot of confidence, it's a story, I acknowledge it, but I think everyone will realize that the most important thing in life, the most important thing in life, is people. It's the people that surround us. It's the people that we're connected to. It's our families, it's our friends. It's people. People make the world go around. That's it. And you've got to like, with that identity, <coughs> you can mute and you can text mute. You can go, oh, um, that person, their success is my success. Then suddenly your identity opens up. It opens up to become the world. Everyone in the world suddenly becomes part of you. And you look out for that. Suddenly, there's no road rage. I used to have tremendous road rage. Now, you know what I do? I have a small little trick. I, it was a trick. Now it's muted more into my natural identity. And what is that? Someone cuts me off. I automatically create a story. I used to create a story that guy ah, is an a-hole, like he just like doesn't care, doesn't believe in the law, must not even have his license, whatever. Now I created it. Maybe like he's got someone in the hospital that he needs to get to. Suddenly you're filled with compassion. It's easy to be compassionate to everyone and yourself when you don't, when you can create a powerful story around. We can think about anything in a different way. Why? Because a lot of times you will never have the facts. I can never know what that person's situation is unless I follow him and get to where he's going. Then like, I ask him. Because even if I see him going into a gambling den, I still don't know what, what's going on until he tells me. So with identity then comes your purpose. And it's simple. It's once you're following your values and principles, that purpose just opens up. Here's how I opened up my purpose. I was really into nutrition and, uh, and food. 
I started like just my brother came to me and he went, Hey, you need to get your blood tested because I my doctor said I'm pre diabetic and we're the same family. And I was like, oh, wow, I, I didn't even think like we don't eat a lot of soda, we don't eat a lot of fast food, all this stuff. How are you pre diabetic? So we went to my GP, I got my blood tested, and while the results were taking a week to come in, I started looking at food labels, started seeing the amount of sugar in there. I just automatically started seeing it because I was like doing something about it. And I just like started looking at every food that I was eating. That led me, so my results came out normal, but that changed my entire diet. I started removing processed foods. I started removing sugar. I got all the way. I was still working as an engineering consultant and I was doing like this. I was reading up a lot. Why? It's my values and principles. I just wanted to know the best things that would nourish me and not make me sick. It's simple. Every one of us has interests, talents, hobbies, traits. We just leave them like that. When that is actually something we might actually want to be doing. We don't because we think it can't happen for us. We can't make it big. I just do painting, that's no life. Why? because it will not give me the standard of a rich life. Because someone said, you can't make money off paintings. It's a standard. It's a big deal. We buy into it and we follow it. So when I go, so when I went like that and I started telling my friends all about the nutrition, I was like, oh, did you know like I'm not sure if I was consuming it. They started asking me, are you preparing for a book? Are you gonna write a book? Like, like you've got so much information. And I was like, no, it doesn't interest me. I don't want to be writing a book. They were like, you should do something with this knowledge. Then it clicked for me. Because look what happened. In my friend's eyes, by talking about it with words, I created an identity. I am the guy, they said, Prashant is the guy who knows about nutrition. He is the guy who knows about food. When people were talking about new diets or new products coming out, or this thing about, oh yeah, check check with Prashant. They would like come to me like, well, what, what do you think of this thing? It was just happening. I didn't mean to create. It just happened. Because I created an identity. They gave me my purpose. They said, you should, I, I took pizza to them. Cauliflower crust pizza. I didn't want to put grains in it because grains are starch and sugar. And at that time, I was staying away from all of that stuff. So I took a cauliflower crust pizza because I used to make it out of home for myself. And they were like, oh, it's so delicious. You should make it and sell it in farmer's markets. And I was like, no, but yeah, wait. I would really love to do that. I would love to quit my engineering consulting job and make pizzas. I actually would love it. Gave me my purpose. I'm not making pizzas, I'm making ice cream. But it gave me my purpose because I'm also a capitalist. So one of my values was I really do want to change the food industry. I really truly believe, after doing all that research, that we are being fed too much sugar, too much processed stuff, too much artificial ingredients, and that became the thing that I was talking about all the time. Words. Created my identity, and then I had nowhere to go. I had nowhere to go. I cornered myself. Because I created this identity, I won't talk about that, that and motorcycles. But motorcycles, the season in Canada is so small that I don't think I can make a living. I remember I said, I can't make a living. I haven't tried it. I'm stuck in that too. But I decided, food. Everyone eats food. I never used to eat ice cream, but I realized after doing my research that the one food that does not have processed, that does not, that you can't find no sugar added ice cream in the market. It's either artificial ingredients, made with sucralose and Splenda. I was like, how can it not be that? I'm gonna do it. And I told all my friends I'm gonna do it. Well, so everyone, I started making ice cream at home. I made it with stevia, I made it with the rich olives. In a hundred batches, I fed it to my friends. I kept talking about it. It cemented, cemented, cemented my identity. I was then the guy who was the ice cream man. Now my friends know me as the ice cream man. 
and it's only like two years old. All the other years I've known my friends for, it's, that identity has vanished. It's now I'm the ice cream man. And the minute I'm the ice cream man, I go in, and there was a thing. I called up all these companies to ask them for no sugar added base, and they said, it can't be done. And I wanted to give up. Here's why I couldn't give up. I couldn't give up because I had created an identity. What am I now going to go say to my friends? I didn't even try. I didn't even try to create my answer. I talked about it all the time. But I'm a phony. I don't have an identity anymore. I'm not going to make ice cream. Now I'm going to go back to doing engineering consulting. Do you think it would matter to my friends? No. But would I have some regret and would I be incomplete later on if I didn't actually push it all the way through? Yeah. You know how much I've already spent on this thing? <laughs> Creating this ice cream that has no sugar added? You're going to love this. My first flavor is vanilla, saffron, oh cardamom. It's like literally Persian ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my third flavor is going to be rose. It's going to be, have to do something with rose. Uh, rose water. I just found like, a really, really good flavor of rose and it just like triggered me to think I have to create my third flavor as rose. But I'm planning on launching, and here's where I'm giving my word to you guys. I'm planning on launching within the next two months. My brand will launch. I'm sourcing the cups right now. I'm sourcing the ingredients. I already have a manufacturer. I have to work on a marketing plan. Uh, and I have to put it across, I have to create the website. Anyone who is interested in taking it on as a project, I'm right here. <laughs> Join me. Because, because what I see and I realize, and this is how it used to be before, was it's all about me and I was all included. And now I understand, no. The only thing I need to stick towards is my values and my principles and my vision. Because my vision is going after what I want. That's my vision. But I can't do it alone. No one can. We need people. And contributions from people that are passionate, self-motivated, have an identity, have integrity, and really do think that this is what they want to go after, I want them. I want them on my team. And I want to promote their success because their success is going to be my success. And this is how I plan on taking down the capitalist system that we've got to make it more socially capital and uh, responsible and new capitalist. I set my mission for my life. My purpose is defined in my word and it's solid and it will remain because I choose to live it by integrity. And my purpose is simply wage a war against refined sugar. So it's going to be ice cream now, then it'll be chocolates, then it'll be candies, then it'll be anything that has refined sugar right now. That's my mission in life. And that's a, I think like that's a great enough mission to like get me on the path. Other than that, the other mission that I've really embraced is connectedness with my family and my friends and <coughs> contributing to the success of people, not looking at people as disposable. People are people and I want to experience them with an open mind, without judgments and without opinions. That's where I'll end guys. I think I'm like two minutes over so I acknowledge that. Wow, thank you so much.
what you need, what qualifications you need, and what you should do in order to achieve that. And then you will define your identity, which is the base of your personal brand. And you will just develop some purposes over that. And that works in a great way. That's a miracle. You can do it about anything in your life. And you can do it about your life as a whole, actually. We have to be authentic. If we achieve, if we manage to be authentic in our lives, we are born again. We, we are born again. And we will experience another life. Uh, I don't expect you to just uh, understand everything of this process um, just in a very clarified way, but just knowing the elements of this process uh, will help you and will raise the idea of that in your mind. And after maybe some months, after a year, your mind will lie on that problem and it will make a lot of miracles for you. Um, I want to appreciate uh, Prashant for just uh, what he does here. I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you just got engaged with what he said or not. I had some uh, previous knowledge about that. But uh, we have some minutes in order to have a question and answer. If any questions, please. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. yeah, well, it wouldn't be complete without another question for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I know that uh, you mentioned that we should uh, uh, see from the whole world, that uh, we should see people such as as outsiders. Just like what will happen to the competition? Yeah. To the competition? Yes. Because when you see the whole world as yourself, there is no competition. Everyone's playing your game. Right? Like, <clears throat> here's the thing. I came here thinking that this is Ali's setup and that it's a burden for me to come here and talk and take out two hours from my Saturday. Like, I could be in Barry's having an aquarium right now. Right? So there's like, if I thought of it like that, that there's competition. But when I think of Ali's success as mine, I want him to succeed. He must have invited a bunch of people. He must have told them about a tech. I cannot make that guy fail. I don't have to be here because I love talking about myself and integrity. I have to be here because he wants me. It's he's going to succeed if I'm here. Those are two different perspectives, right? And that you can look at it from any perspective. All I'm suggesting is look at it from the perspective that makes the other person's win your win. Just choose that. You can. You have the choice. You have a say in the matter of your life and the way you think about things. You don't have to be a victim to circumstances, popular culture, or any other way of creating the story. You can think of a story, whatever story you've got right now, about anything. About like, oh, that person is in competition with me. You can actively change it and make it yours. How? For example, let me find an example. For example, uh, Netflix, some years ago, I remember that was labeled for um, showing porn. Mm -hmm. And I knew that it was a propaganda. Um, however, it, it made it sell less and it reduced the uh, number of users a lot. Um, now it's been changed, but still people know Netflix because, uh, you know, still people know that um, product um, with that label. Okay. <laughs> no, but even if even if that is true, 
right? Because I've got your words, and so I'm going to deal with your words. Even if that is true, it's okay. What is the objective? What is the competition for? For sales? Why do we expect that they're not going to have any competition? We just expect that. It's like me watching the guy littering off the, the side of the street. I just expect him not to litter. Can I control him? No. Why am I taking it personally? Why is even Netflix taking it personally? I mean, it was personal attack, so I can see how they can take it personally. But things happen. The people will have all kinds of motivations, all kinds of reasons for doing their own thing. They haven't had this talk. It's an example. But so what? It's okay. Should, if you have authenticity and integrity, that will not sway you from your own path because you're not going for the standard. What is the standard at play there? That Netflix should make a certain revenue? Who said that? It's a standard. What is a value? A value is that they put out good content. That's a value. No one can stop them from doing that. Yeah, they can criticize its sales numbers. But does Netflix control the sales numbers? No. People control the sales numbers. Netflix controls content. So you apply it to your life, or even if I apply it to my life, it's about when I'm going into it, is my intention competition, or is my intention to make the other person win? That's all I need. I don't have to care about any of this, because that's a story. Okay, that's... Uh, question, all right? Yes, okay. for sure. Thank you so much. Actually, I uh, took a landmark about two years ago. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, and, uh, I was familiar with the concepts, actually, but uh, you presented perfectly, and I really appreciate that because, yeah, because I already passed that course, yeah. I know what it was, and now I can say that it was really perfect. Thank you. So Thank much. you. I appreciate that. It's very good. I can always watch on the So if you didn't just care that, okay, I was a punctual, because you, for sure, just destroy also integrity of Audi. Mm -hmm. So how we can just make it this all? I mean, make, uh, understand people that they just make a mess. Mm -hmm. So is it our responsibility or how we can just make this interconnected? So it's, it's the integrity works on promises, right? Yeah. So if you made a promise to someone, and you know, like there are times when I break promises, and I don't care about restoring integrity. Lots of times, and we do it all the time. Here's an example: jaywalking. See, we're born into the society. We want to be a citizen. We want to live here. And then there are laws. And what are laws? Laws are agreements. We make the agreement by living in it. Otherwise, I should go away to the Himalayas and like live there as a hermit if I didn't want the laws, right? But I can't do that. I need something from society, so I'm going to stay here and know the laws. Now, what happens when I jaywalk? I break the law. Do you think I go back to the DM, like police, the cops, and say, oh, I acknowledge that I was jaywalked and that I'm going to clean up my mess. How what was the impact on you? No, there was no indiscernible impact, not that I saw it. Maybe there was an impact to the person that was coming around the car and just had to break. When I was like jaywalking, there was an impact there. Now, ideally, I would go to that person and say, hey, I'm really sorry I was jaywalking. But there's really nothing to clean up. The actual clean up is me actually acknowledging it itself. And that's good enough. There are cases when that's good enough. Why do you want to clean up? It's not about the other person. The clean up is for yourself. You see, we don't clean up. We have regrets and we have incomplete things in our past that we put into our future. And so our future is not free. We're not free from the future. The 
reason they're not creating the future is because there's stuff that we're hiding from the past in the stories in our mind that we're incomplete with. And we have that regret all the time. And when you start following this way, you start seeing those things. So there are things that don't bother me because I'm not incomplete with them. If I'm jaywalk, no one's there, I'm not incomplete. But if I jaywalk and someone scratches, screeches and stuff so hard, and I know that, I will at least be thinking about it for the next little bit. I'll be thinking about it, the sound, the everything, right? It's gonna be in my mind. There's gonna be something there. The person's expression, all of that. That is called incomplete. That is when you need to make up. That is when I need to restore integrity. Because otherwise I'm gonna carry it with me. Now, jaywalking is a simple example. Maybe you wouldn't have, or whatever. But you know how, like, say, like, you shoplift once, you're likely to shoplift again and again and again, and all of that, until you complete it. You know, why do people go through so much trauma and live, like, in depression and all of that stuff in all their life? It's just stuff that they haven't completed in the past. And it may not even be them. Things done to you can be traumatic. But we have the power to complete it. It's not about restoring integrity at that point. It's really about not living out of stories. And that's a slightly different thing. <clears throat> but that is why you want to complete. The completing okay. is important. So, thank you. Uh, we will talk about stories and how to get rid of the stories in the, the following sessions. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different <coughs> subjects. Actually, what we are trying to do in this class <coughs> these classes or how to uh, achieve authenticity. It's not that easy. You know, we talked about it in previous session and we have to get rid of a lot of things in order to get authenticity, but uh, the more you get authentic, the more you enjoy your life and the more, the more you achieving your goals and your purposes. So, we're going to have very exciting sessions. And uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
when you don't have something, you don't know what it's going to be like. The minute, so you want and we something. actually love our stories, right? Because yeah, that's, that's because the I thing is, as human beings, we don't want to be wrong. So when we create a story, we live in it like it's real. Because we don't want to be wrong. And we don't like anyone telling us that our story is wrong. Because I, I would never listen. My mom must have said this to me before, but I was not receptive. Because I was living in the story. I was like, nah, you just say that. <laughs> now when she said it, I actually have questions for her. And with whichever way I asked the question, the impression was that she's happy with me. And I was like, you know what? Why do I believe the story of what she hasn't even said? I'm going to actually create a new story. She loves me. And she's actually said that. So it's a more valid story. So I'm going to keep that. It's people who go, I thought that going, my relationship with my mom was the best it could ever be. Oh, she loves you, the story, or is what's really happened? She loves me is what she actually said. So that's the word. Because I choose her to believe my word, I have to then believe her word. So I believe her word. She says she loves me. Done. Until she tells me otherwise, I will now always think my mom loves me. And it removes any story that I have. And believe me, when we are operating with stories, those back and forth happen. Because you're operating from a story. The minute you actually remove the story from the equation, many different things will happen and fun things will happen. I got connected with my mom and I now like we talk on a completely different level. She didn't want me to make ice cream, right? And this is where the occurrence comes in. She felt that, ah, oh, would you like, what's on? She's like, you're an engineer, you can become the CIO of Hydro One, why don't you go take that job? And I was like, no, I don't want to do that job. And she didn't get that, right? Now, when I suddenly occurred for her differently because I changed the way I looked at it. She didn't do anything different. She did not take landmark. She did not, all I did was just share with her what I really thought. I told her all of my stories. I told her, I think you think I'm a failure. She said, no. She told me in return. So when that happened, what happened? Three months later, she calls me and she goes, you sure? You know you had left ice cream like six months ago when you were making a prototype batch in the fridge. I tried it today and it's amazing. I think you have something there. She would, I fell off my chair because I was like, my mom is actually telling me that I should continue to make ice cream? It's impossible. I never thought that that would be possible. I thought my relationship was great. When I remove the story, then that happens. So when you say to me, you know, they like the going back and forth, there's something called personality, which is amazing. That's what makes people unique. Yeah. But then there's something called living in a story, which is different. So when you start seeing that you're living in a story, it can improve your relationship. You can get more connected, more intimate. The personality doesn't have to go away. The humor doesn't have to go away. The taunting each other doesn't have to go away. That's just the way we talk, communicate. That's fine. But the story that we create when it's not been said, right? That is a problem. That's what I realized. Thank you. So when you were explaining the stories, I was thinking that uh, it's not a question. I just want to confirm something with you. So. Like sometimes I feel like stories originated originated from other sources can be found part of our stories. For example, last night I had a discussion with this group and I was telling them how damaging the effect of media can be, right? Media? Media, right? No, when I was telling this, I didn't know exactly why, but right now I can feel like it's because of the stories that they constantly create and most of them can be false. Stories and ideals, and ideals, right? They're right. creating how, when we watch a thing, they put a hero of the thing, the yeah. protagonist, into a situation and that person does a few things. Why do you think our media changed to like a lot of people saying that the heroes don't smoke anymore? Because it's related. A lot of our like generation, our kids, were smoking because they saw a big poster of a manly looking Marlboro man. What is the definition of a man? Well, they created it on a billboard. Exactly. And so we believed it, and then we started abusing our lungs for it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's why we have to be careful if we are going to vaccinate it against a lot of things. That we, we only have to be careful if we yeah. don't have our own values and principles. Exactly. And we need to rely on standards and ideals. The minute you start seeing that those two are different, you won't buy into the standards and ideals. Because you'll do your own test of reality. And you'll be like, well, it's not in my values and principles. I mean, my value is to be healthy. So I must do all the things that a healthy person does. And if that person is smoking and that's a hero, that's a standard. Someone else is telling me you should smoke and be a hero. Not me, because to me, from what that's I know, that's not the value that I want to embody. It seems to me, I oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, it seems to me that the standards and ideals are not change it because you found out something <clears throat> about how you actually want to be yeah. but while you were being the other thing you actually thought you were actually wanting to be that right so yeah. you're authentic throughout you don't have to change you're still going after what you want before you thought you wanted this and you were going after it and you were investing in it you were authentic right yeah now suddenly you come across new information you suddenly go oh yeah i want to be a meat producer suddenly i find out something about veganism that just makes me go, oh, I don't want to touch animal products. What if suddenly tomorrow we got research saying, all the cows in North America have got like this kind of disease, so, and so the milk is always like bad and it makes people fat, or makes them mad. You think I'm gonna still keep doing ice cream? No, not dairy ice cream anyways, I'm gonna move to coconut ice cream. That's what I had to do. That, does that mean that my identity has changed? Yes. It's yes. It's kind of a reliability risk, right? Because you're saying it's possible for me to be another man in the future. You're always a new man at every moment. But they are investing on what I'm describing as a man of ice cream. What man? Because your identity, you're actively creating it. Actively. And you don't need to be stuck with an identity. 
It's, you go back to authenticity. Identity is only the third step. You're missing the first step. Go after what you want. At any time you realize it's not what you want, that moment you're being inauthentic. Because if you're still doing the same thing that you were doing yesterday, now you're being inauthentic. And now you have no identity. You still have an identity of before, but really it's not born, it's not authentic. The key is to have an authentic identity, right? We all have an identity, even when we're not authentic. We have a name, we a name, right? So all of that, great. But now what you're saying is, what about other people? How are they going to look at me? I'm not talking about other people thinking of you as identity. This is your identity. This is what you think. Other people will think whatever they will think. That's a story. You haven't asked them yet. <clears throat> Maybe they think you're awesome for realizing that you don't want to do this and you want to do something else. That just adds another awesomeness to your identity. That's all it does. Maybe we they have didn't... only one unique identity. We can have different identities. We can have different identities at different moments. Yeah. As long as, and they actually, you don't need to try to create the identity. That's not the thing. See, the way it flows, in authenticity, you need to try and create no stories. You need to go after what you want. That's the only way to be authentic. With integrity, you need to keep your word. Everything else happens. You don't need to do anything. It'll happen. You don't need to create an identity. Well, what am I going to do with like, creating an ice cream man identity? Wear an ice cream man hat and walk around? No. All I have to do is go after what I want. So when I'm having a discussion with someone, I'm talking about ice cream because that's what I want. That automatically creates my identity. I never asked anyone to call me ice cream man. I was surprised when they called me ice cream man. I was like, that's not how I think of myself. I think of myself as a food entrepreneur, not as an ice cream entrepreneur. I don't even like ice cream. I mean, I, now I like ice cream, but I, that's after like a hundred batches of taste testing. But I never used to have ice cream. I used to have popsicles with lots of sugar in them. Now I would not touch a popsicle, and now my identity is Prashant, who does not have any sugar. That's my identity to my friends. When I go for like dinners, they say, Prashant, can I change that identity? You know, having values and principles only makes you have a better identity, not a worse identity. It doesn't confuse people, it actually makes people more reliable on you. Uh, because it makes you more reliable for them. Because you're going after your values and principles, everything about you will be losing authenticity about it. You would just like, and you'd be clear, you'd be absolutely clear. When we operate from values and principles, Conviction. When we operate from standards and ideals, we don't have conviction. We falter. Um, I'm sorry. It's just a discussion. You know, uh, you said authentic authenticity is to go after what, what you, you want. want. Okay. <laughs> what if what we feel we want is a product of our stories, and we don't know if they are good stories or bad stories. So this <coughs> dynamism. Today, what do you want tomorrow? What did you want yesterday? Everyone was saying. If someone says, 
what I want in my life is to avenge whoever has annoyed me. That's based on a story. Is it authentic? It's, it That's depends on the story. person. No, 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 no. Avenging, okay. So that's not necessary. That is a story, a big story, but then you have to go a little bit deeper into that. You have to go, okay, what happened? You are always got to ask the question, what happened? Because the minute you ask the question, what happened, suddenly removes the story. So if you ever want to distinguish whether something is a story or you're basing your actions out of what happened, because that's really authenticity, it's just ask that question, what happened? So like someone wants to avenge someone, what happened? Okay, they want to, they did something wrong to them. So like they slashed their car, okay, with a key. That's what happened. That is a happen. It's not a story. Okay. So before getting offended, you should get rid of our games. As you say, right? Games are stories, again. Okay? Games are based on stories, right? The games are when you're living in your story and you are doing things, then those are games. But here's the thing about like the stories, right? When you say what you want, they, it's, it's, it's unavoidable for it to be linked to stories because it's related on our experience, right? What I want to change the food industry, right? And I want to remove sugar from the market. I want more options for people yeah, out thank there. You. That's yeah, then I, I went to. I was just going to mention that it's very. You said authenticity. That was the greatest word of you for me. And it's another that you said authenticity is getting, getting rid of stories. Can uh, master your stories. Be aware of all the stories you have. You have chosen the stories you have. You are authentic in its main meaning. Okay? But that's the main challenge. That's the main law. war going on, we are talking about it like war, so it's a story. Yeah. But, um, oh, sorry, I was yeah, no, go ahead. Your question resolved? I mean, your question resolved? My question? No, I, I still have another question sure. after you. I just wanted to say something to you, gentlemen. Um, if you're making a story, uh, you make a story about um, not being so successful in what you want to do, Confusing, it's not a paradox, it actually is true. Humans don't like being wrong. We don't like being wrong. Mm -hmm. Our actions always fall in line with our word, especially if you treat your word with importance. So, if you're following this, you have integrity, you don't need to focus on the action, you focus on the word. I give my word to Ali, right? Now, but you did the action after that. So first, automatically. <laughs> yeah. Look, oh, yeah, yeah. I said first. to I said to Ali that I'm going to be there, right? right? 
And now I know if I want to be there, I need to put it in my calendar. So I automatically put it in my calendar, right? And then automatically that day, if the calendar rings, I, it's pure action is all I'm doing. I'm just I put it in my calendar as an action. I get into my car as an action. I go drive as an action. I come here and talk as an action. There's, this is what I also say, there's nothing hard or easy in life. That's a story. All it is is one action, another action, another action. But how do you start the actions? There's something for the action. There's word. And word triggers the action. We don't want to be wrong, human beings. But I say I'm going to be there. This is why we have incompleteness in our life. Because we've given our word to things and not followed them up. And then we have regrets and incompleteness. Mm -hmm. So, if we follow the integrity and we know to keep our word, you don't need to focus on the action. It'll happen. If you just believe you want to keep your word, it'll happen. It's hard. But there's no effort in taking action. You know, effort is me lifting the table. That is physically effort. But talking to someone, calling someone, driving somewhere, it's not action. It's just pure action. It's not hard. It's not easy. We give things these meanings when we don't want to do something or we want to do them. That's it. It's like saying tired. Oh, I'm tired. I can't go there. That's such a story. Because yeah, you may have blood. You may have blood glucose that may be a little bit down. You might have, you know, you're like not eating that morning. But what is tired? Tired doesn't actually exist in our bodies anywhere. It just doesn't exist. It's just a general physical feeling that we're getting, and our emotions and our feelings. And if we keep honoring our emotions and feelings, we'll get nothing done, ever. So we can't honor our feelings and emotions. They just happen to us. They're chemical reactions. Right, integrity does not rely on our feelings. Integrity relies on our word. So, I give my word, I follow it up, you know, no matter how tired we are, if we had a baby that just fell and needs to go to a ambulance to a hospital, you would drive them there. That means, then where is the tiredness? Tiredness is a story. So I was like, I used to think it was a valid excuse. Oh mom, I can't come like for the gathering, family gathering that I promised two weeks ago and you reminded me five times after that because I'm tired. I just didn't sleep well last night. No integrity. No integrity. Because if I knew I had to go there, why did I not sleep well last night? And even if I didn't sleep well last night, better show up. Because I gave my promise. Simple. It doesn't need to be complicated. That's why we get stuck when we think that life is more complicated than, than just giving our word. The word, if you know how to back it up, that is why this is there. If you know how to back up your word, you really need to do just these three things. Everything else flows. Don't create stories, go after what you want, and keep your word to yourself. If I'm going to say I'm going to open an ice cream company, I better create an ice cream company. And I'm already delayed, by the way, by six months. I was supposed to have my launch at Enercare Center in a show in, in March, and I was down on myself about it, like constantly. And there's an impact. I'm feeling the impact. I have no money. Six months of not working, no money. My ingredient suppliers, they're not responding that quickly because they were like, oh, he was going to open then. He still isn't open. So now I have to do extra effort, but that is me cleaning up my mess. It just has to happen that way. Nothing wrong or right about it. Not good or bad. You think I'm going to give up? No, I'm not going to give up. I'm still getting there. It's still going to happen because I gave my word. So why do you call it Presumption, a judgment, an opinion, an assumption, they're all stories. I call them all stories because they're all stories. See, a judgment is not an assumption, but they're both stories. That's why I go to the top layer. Because they're made up. We make them up. If you have facts to validate it, it's no longer a story. Okay, so, so they're not equal. It's just, it's one of them, right? Yeah, it's one of them. The story is a big bracket, and these are all small pieces in it. Yeah. 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 Ye
There are stories of that, we make them up. That's yeah. the original. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure.